All right, welcome back to our first uh, community organized session of SDSS. I'd like to introduce the co-organizers of this session, Reproducing and Replicating Spatial Data Science. Uh, today with us, we have Joseph Holler of the Department of Geography of Middlebury College and Peter Kedron of the Department of Geography at UCSB. And also a co-organizer, but not here today, is Sarah Barden the, of the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning of Arizona State University. So I will go ahead and hand it over to you. You can see your screen, so take it away. Thank you. Um, so I'm Joseph and uh, we're presenting to you from Middlebury, Vermont today. It's finally summer here after a summer of rain and uh, deluges of flooding. Uh, so the title of our talk is Reproducing and Replicating Spatial Data Science. And what we'd like to do today is actually start out with a little bit of an interactive survey to guide us in our presentation of material throughout the rest of the workshop. And following that, um, I'll be synthesizing the results while Peter presents the main concepts and sort of front end conceptual framework uh, of our work. And we'll follow that up by bringing the, the results of the interactive survey into the presentation and uh, discussing those and their implications for the remainder of the workshop. And we'll present some of the infrastructure that we've been developing to enhance reproducibility and replicability in the spatial data sciences. Um, and then finally, we'll open up for an uh, interactive questions and answers session. And um, so if you don't mind obliging us, um, we have a QR link, uh, QR link here, or you can type into a web browser, go.middlebury.edu slash H-E-G-S-R-R. Eggs, reproducibility and replicability. And this is just a short survey. The first is uh, two questions, based, or two blocks of questions, basically. The first has a list of 11 open and reproducible research practices. And we'd like you to uh, click and drag each of those practices into one of three bins, depending on whether you're already using that practice in your scholarship, uh, whether you're aware of that practice and perhaps interested in starting to use it, um, or whether you're unaware or uninterested in that practice. So if you don't recognize one of these, that's fine. Please just bin it in the unaware and uninterested question. Uh, okay, Peter just added a link to that in the chat as well. And then there are 10 quick Likert uh, technology adoption questions to help us get a baseline of where people are at in terms of likelihood to adopt these practices uh, in the future. And we'd like to follow up with surveys. So there is one question to ask for an email address if you're willing to do so. And then we will present in aggregate form uh, de-identified results during the workshop and we'll post those on our website afterwards. Uh, so if you don't mind, I will give you about two, two and a half minutes to try to open up that survey and uh, add some results to that database. Okay, great. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, as Joe said, I'm uh, Dr. Peter Kedrin. Thanks for working on that survey. We can see that we have got some responses coming in here. And so as you guys finish up uh, completing those questions and Joe's compiling some of the results, I wanted to take a moment to do some of the introduction definitional stuff to set up the conversation we're going to have later on about some of our infrastructure and implementing some of these open science practices in practical projects, either in original research or in reproduction and replication attempts. So just to get us all on the same page here. Just to get us all on the same page here, let's just quickly talk about um, definitions of reproducibility and replicability. There are a number of these different options, obviously. We're not going to be totally comprehensive here, but I do want to sort of put something on the table so we're at least be speaking the same language in today's session. And we've oriented these a bit towards data science rather than larger, more complicated discussions, but we're going to have to really open to those in the discussion section at the end as well. So when we talk about reproduction and replication, uh, we're going to kind of be building on the National Academies report from a few years ago. And we typically think along these, um, defined, these definitions along two axes. One about the consistency in the data we use in the uh, reproduction replication attempt, and the other being in the consistency in the method and the procedures. 
And typically when we think about this, we just think, are the data the same or different? Are the procedures the same or different? Which define the two axes in this two by two matrix. There are many other axes we can add to this conversation, but for today we're gonna to keep it kind of simple, to keep us oriented on the straight and narrow here. Um, for example, you might also think about whether when you change the data, do you also change the location or the population being studied as well? And how do you know when that's happening to make it a bit more geographic and a bit more spatial, for example. But I think one of the things that Joe and I like to emphasize when we talk about these concepts is it's not simply about reproducing the same computational results necessarily. It's also about thinking beyond that and assessing the claims and the inferences made in a particular study or by a, a particular piece of research. So we like this two by two matrix, which we borrow from Christensen, a book on reproducing and replicating in the social sciences, which adds these additional dimensions of when you keep data the same and procedures the same, for instance, what you're often pursuing is some kind of conclusion validity or verification of prior results, maybe an internal validity assessment. Um, whereas if you change other things and move into different boxes, for example, using different data but repeating the procedures, you're starting to move towards replication more so. So if you think about this box along these two dimensions, in the first uh, here, if you're moving kind of laterally along the first row and keeping the data the same, you're largely moving in the world of reproduction with the same data, same procedure, looking for the same results in similar or the same context. You're looking to sort of verify or uh, check prior conclusions. And maybe if you change some of the procedures, you're doing a robustness check that's reanalyzing the results to see if they hold up under slightly different conditions. Alternatively, as you move and start to collect new data, potentially from new spatial contexts or new locations, you're moving into the world of replication, where again, you have similar procedures, you wanna compare results, but now you're thinking about um, uh, external validity checks. Do these um, results and inferences hold up in new locations under new conditions and or extending work into new uh, areas and basically almost like being new research here. Uh, so again, that's just kind of clarifying terms for us to be on the same page as we move through this conversation. So when we talk about reproduction, we're thinking of same data, same procedures, same results, same context, again, those verification kind of checks. And when we're talking about replication, we're really thinking about gathering new data, potentially changing context and doing these kind of external validity checks. Um, and this is important because if you're thinking about it from a data science perspective, this is a paper that we presented two years ago in this same conference and it's in the conference proceedings about uh, moving towards a veridical uh, spatial data science. And this is a data science that is enriched and enlivened by the practice of reproduction and replication. So it's not just about making sure someone else can access your data and your code and reproduce your results. We want that reproduction or, or the potential replications to serve this important function of the external validation to build knowledge accumulation, evidence accumulation, so we can continue to advance our understanding of the world through the data science we do. And really what we're gonna show you guys today is essentially a bunch of infrastructure that we've been building to try to move uh, projects and the discipline forward uh, through replication and reproduction towards this goal of having a data science that isn't just sort of uh, predictive and computational, but one that's kind of building in these fundamental mechanisms of science as best we can within the constraints of a data-driven uh, workflow. So we're only going to present a portion of the work we've been doing. This is uh, work supported by the National Science Foundation. If you're interested in our larger project, everything is available at our hegs.github.io uh, website, which Joe will be showing here in an in a, in a interactive video in a moment. But just so far in this project, we've built a lot of different things. Uh, we're going to mainly focus on what's in red here today, this reproducible project template and repository because this gives you kind of a backbone structure to implement some of the open science practices you just responded to in the survey and you know, tweak them and implement them in ways that work for your projects or your reproduction replications. But we've used this backbone template within our larger project already to produce five peer reviewed publications. We've done eight reproduction and replication studies as exemplars that people can access and pull from our open access GitHub repositories and open science frameworks. So you can you know, fork these things, replicate them, build on top of them, 
We've also done surveys of researcher practices off of these templates so people can um, kind of see how the field sees these topics and how they're using these practices in their own work. And on top of that, we're also developing a manual. We have some course syllabi available, and we've already implemented this with a number of students and our own coursework in two different universities and have taught a bunch of RAs these practices as well. So we're really trying to build a larger framework here and environment to you know, educate people about these practices, integrate this not only into research, but also into teaching and fold those two things together so that the next generation of scholars are much more familiar with these practices and have some of the you know, rudimentary building blocks to make their projects more reproducible, replicable, and hopefully as we move into things like today, we'll continue to get feedback on these uh, products from the community, uh, like you guys in this uh, session today, and that will improve these products as we go forward because they could definitely use more work and they're continually changing and, um, and building. So with that, I think it's a good time to shift back over and look at some of our survey results uh, that you guys just filled out so we can see where we are as a group and then orient some of our discussion about these practices and the materials that we've been developing around these um, specific practices. So I'll hand it back to Joe and we can walk through the surveys and practices together. That's good, thank you for that uh, introduction, Peter. And I think I may have overestimated how quickly Paltris could collect, synthesize, and visualize those results <laughs> um, in the slow motion uh, beta testing that I did with myself and a couple of other people that worked just fine, but in this live format, it's not keeping up with things. So, but however, I can also announce that we've been working on some systematic surveys of people who have published to geographic research, and we do have a preprint of that uh, reproduction survey uh, and results. Uh, we have that on Open Science Foundation, uh, so you can find that through our website or through our main website. And so we already have sort of a guess about what the results may have been <laughs> based on that systematic survey of folks who have been recently publishing. So if you give me a second to just switch slide decks, I will open up the next um, I'll open up the next uh, piece of our presentation. Just give me a second for the transaction costs of doing that. Appreciate the patience in that regard. And the default setting is always to put the presentation on the wrong screen. So there we go. So open and reproducible research practices, a quick review of practices in light of the survey results that we assume you may have given us. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I put the, I was intending to order these in terms of how familiar people already are to how the least familiar practices. So sharing data, I think it's pretty universal that we understand reproducibility in terms of the need to make data for your study readily available in the most complete and unmodified form, admissible by law and ethical protocols so that other researchers can inspect that data in your study. Uh, similarly, most people understand the need to share a complete description of your methods and ideally, if you're doing spatial data science, that means your work is computational and therefore you should be including the scripts or the code or models uh, associated with your research product uh, along with the paper. What most of us over, often overlook is that to make that code and that data most useful and interoperable, interoperable and findable for other researchers, that we need to document metadata for those data products and those code products that are associated with our research. So do you provide information about your study and each of its components in a standardized format uh, following international standards from the ISO or the Dublin Core? One of the big, <laughs> one of the big benefits that what we've been building in terms of the infrastructure is what we're trying to do is take these different elements and fold them into a packageable, shippable, very digestible, format so anyone can pick these things up very easily. And kind of the key to that has been building off the back of some existing resources that some of you are, I'm sure many of you are already familiar with in terms of GitHub, Git, and the OSF project interface. And the real key thing that these add to our infrastructure and again, to any project is the idea of version control. And one of the key things that makes reproducibility and reproducing research quite difficult many times is even if you have access to the data and code, as Joe was just mentioning, it's really being able to see what people did 
uh, when they built that data code. We'll show you an example in a moment that even though when data code are available, there's often a lot of code you don't need. There's a lot of cleaning that needs to be done. There's a lot of decisions that are made. So version control through GitHub really allows you to track the provenance of a research project um, and communicate that to the people that then try to build on your work in the future. So that's a key aspect of these kind of open science practices and something we've really been building uh, into our infrastructure, which we'll show you in a moment. Yeah, and uh, similarly, there are key changes may have occurred in the research design at various phases, one of them being the peer review process. And we've seen that where uh, some significant uncertainty may have been added to a study because of the peer review process. But that um, story, that history of the change in research design is made opaque by not having research uh, version control. Yeah, and a benefit of doing all this together is building a comprehensive research compendium that collects all the components of your study in a single location. So again, using those version control and kind of open science software uh, environments and packages, we can kind of link all these things together and have one big central location that includes literally from start to finish, um, you know, everything from the data and the code to the computational notebooks, which format the papers, to uh, the OSF preprints uh, that link with DOIs that give persistent identification to all these different elements, uh, all organized through our central template that we're going to show you here in a moment. Right. Some approaches to reproducibility might uh, prompt you to register a protocol on one server, register data elsewhere, register code somewhere else, get each a DOI, and then link to all those DOIs from a research manuscript, but that leaves a lot of work for the, a reproducing researcher to put all the pieces back together again and make them work. Uh, whereas we find it much better to keep everything in one consistent, organized structure with internal links that continue to work over time. As Peter was just mentioning, uh, the archiving all this stuff uh, is, you know, you essentially need to put it in a persistent digital archive, which has backups. Um, perhaps on the internet archive um, and assigned a DOI or digital object identifier link so that they can be easily found um, and persist over time with relative confidence. And then if you want people to build on these things, obviously we, we suggest an open licensing and our package, as Joe will show you in a moment here, ships with uh, an open access uh, licensing for the products you can build on your work with proper attribution. Uh, and this is really important because, again, it, it's this kind of idea of uh, setting things up so people can expand on your work very easily and accessibly and creating a legal framework for that to be allowed, essentially. Right. You may put your work up on GitHub, but if you don't add a license to it, it's technically copyrighted and technically not permissible for another researcher to reuse that work and incorporate it into a future study, which is what we want to be able to do in an open science framework. And finally, most people are probably doing this already, I hope, in this group, but do use and, and cite the research software with redistributable source code. And so some approaches to reproducibility might say that it's okay to use a proprietary statistics software package or a proprietary geographic information systems package. But unfortunately, if you do that, then it's not guaranteed that you can keep and redistribute a version of that software to make it possible to continue to use research over time. And that includes wrapping it into a computational container like Docker. And so again, we built the sort of backbone of our project around using this kind of open source software uh, from the get-go that integrates all the pieces together to sort of make that easier with some instructions and a manual, things like that. And we'll show you in a minute. And furthermore, we found many studies that have provided their data and they provided their code. Um, and perhaps at the front end of that code, you call your libraries or load in your packages, right? Uh, but they may have inadequate documentation of the whole computational environment. So that means which version of R, which version of Python was used, which version of each, each of those individual packages was used, and is there some mechanism for recreating that computational environment in the future for either yourself as the original researcher or someone else that's trying to reproduce the work? There's uh, just in kind of incredible amount of barriers in terms of trying to get code that's even a couple of years old uh, to work on any uh, kind of environment that we can put together based on the documentation provided by the authors and just trying to guess at what point in time we may have 
installed Python and they've installed the packages used in their study. And finally, the big question here is, do you ever attempt and share reproduction or replication studies? I think we found in our research that a fair number of people actually do attempt reproductions or replications, but maybe don't think of it as a formal form of research that can be published or should be shared with the public in and of itself, as opposed to a step towards learning a new method or a step towards uh, checking another researcher's results before extending them. Yeah, a lot of researchers told us that they do these things internal to their lab groups um, or as sort of like an initial step on a new project, but often don't share that information. And this creates what's commonly known as a file drawer problem. Um, well, a version of the file drawer problem uh, in, in the research literature where we maybe we're finding contradictory evidence or things like this, but it's just kind of being tucked away and not shared with the wider community, which in you know, theory can slow down our progress on different scientific questions and different real world problems. So again, we're trying to encourage everyone uh, to work in a more reproducible and replicable manner, a reproducible manner, and then also to attempt more reproduction and replication studies, um, because again, we believe they play these important functions in uh, science uh, and the advancement of knowledge. So again, we're about to show you some infrastructure uh, on how we've kind of built that uh, environment to make that easier for everyone and to fold in many of these practices we just talked about into one sort of like uh, clearinghouse place for project organization that again, you can tweak and mess up with any way you want, but it's a starting point to make it a little bit easier to build these practices into your work. Uh, free registration. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the least commonly reported practice, I think, in our survey was the registration of an analysis plan. And this dovetails with the idea of using version control to track all of the changes uh, in your research design as it develops over time. But pre-registration is making a public commitment to a particular set of hypotheses and analytical methods for answering those hypotheses um, before you actually start collecting data or conducting your analytical work. And that helps avoid the file drawer problem if you don't find significant results. Um, then there's less of an incentive to those away or throw them into the wasteland. Uh, and also, well, we haven't focused about it too much here, but there's actually an even stronger version of this of um, registered reports where, in fact, you would submit your analytical workflow to something like a peer reviewed publication. They would approve that workflow, and then, regardless of whether the result was statistically significant or quote unquote interesting, they would commit to publish that outcome. Um, uh, regardless of how it came out, because the research was uh, thought to be valid or assessed to be valid and interesting at the design phase. That's a step down the road beyond pre-registration, but it's a natural extension of this kind of work as well. But again, we are not really familiar with that in many journals, particularly in the spatial or geographic, yeah, science, but spatial or geographic sciences that yeah, I know of. Something that could be built towards in the future, but that's two steps down the road to be sure. And those can also be very helpful if you're doing a formal replication study so that um, it minimizes conflicts or misunderstandings with the original authors, um, depending on how the results of that study turn out, because you all agree on the validity of the replication study design beforehand. Mm -hmm. okay. And so uh, I think at this point, we'd like to tack over to and is be patient with me for one moment as I have the transaction costs of just switching between media again. Uh, I'll stop sharing for one moment and then I'll start sharing again. But we're about to show you a short video that introduces the infrastructure we've been developing. And I'd just like to say that we've been using this infrastructure for original studies, for reproduction studies, and for replication studies um, of a variety of types. Some of them are surveys with human subjects data. And some of them are purely data science or uh, secondary data downloading and data crunching type studies. Uh, and so we are building this to be flexible and sort of ideally universally applicable to various types of studies in geographic sciences. So let me focus on video sharing, share screen, and, and I'll fire this up. Hi, this is Joseph Haller, and I'd like to give you a preview of the infrastructure that myself and Dr. Kedron have been developing to facilitate reproducible and replicable research in the geographical sciences. 
You may have landed here from our research website, xrr.github.io. Let's go to GitHub link. One of our pinned key pinned uh, resources is the hexrr template. This template is designed to facilitate researcher adoption of open science and reproducible practices, and by extension, improve reproducibility and replicability of spatial data science and geographic research. The template ships with the ESD license, this license file, to uh, make it so that other researchers have legal permission to reproduce and extend your work with proper attribution. If we scroll down, we can see that there's a top level readme that populates this repository with study level metadata uh, for digital archiving and searchability of your research including explicit spatial and temporal uh, metadata about your study. We are also presently developing a manual that demonstrates how to use this template in university courses, your research, and taken as a whole, this template can be considered a research com compendium, and ideally a, a competition. That manual, which is uh, in production, uh, but already useful for many components of the template, is linked right to the right-hand side here. In this video, we will illustrate how open science research practices are supported by our template structure by showing how we deployed it to conduct a reproduction study and set up a replication study to be completed by students in the semester this fall. So let's go to uh, the main HexRR repository and open up that example study, RPL Spielman 2020. This replication of Spielman 2020 reproduces a paper and it's linked down here related to metadata of her study by Spielman et al. evaluating social vulnerability indicators, criteria, and application to the social vulnerability index. This paper is an example of a replication study of which there are few in geography. And, and additionally, the SOVI is a highly influential model. Uh, the original publication, which had already garnered 7,134 citations by the time we recorded this video. We wanted to use this as a hands-on example to teach undergraduate GIS students open and reproducible research practices. Another reason we selected this article is because <laughs> the authors did make available the data and code used in their analyses. You may think that because these authors took the time to share their data and their code in a GitHub repository, that it would be relatively easy to reproduce the results. This was not the case. In fact, reproducing the study took significant effort by a faculty member and a research assistant with significant GIS, spatial analysis, and computer science experience. The paper was well written and the data and code were available. However, the organization of those materials, the tacit knowledge that went into producing the results were missing. Our template addresses these challenges and makes it easier for others to recreate, assess, build on your work. Our effort to reproduce Spielman et al. Uh, re recreated many intermediate products. The two key summary products are re report detailing our reproduction attempted findings and a pre-analysis plan for a subsequent replication attempt that will extend this work. Down in the related to menu, we can find those reports registered on OSF. The main reason for us to use OSF and to show OSF to you right now is that we make a permanent version of particular stages of our research in the record on OSF, archive it, and get a digital object identifier or DOI link for those products. So this is the one for the reproduction report. And here's the one for our pre-registration of an analysis plan for replication study to be conducted this fall. And each of these are linked to an associated overarching project which is also linked to GitHub. And this project sits within our overarching research project, uh, which is the reproducibility and replicability of open science practices in the geographical sciences subcomponents for each of our papers and publications. So how did we go about this research and how did our template support that effort? Let's see how it worked using the Spielman example. We already covered the top level of the, of the structure with our README and our license. And then we have this routine structure of directories to organize all of the components of a research project with relative links. 
We start a project by writing an analysis plan. And for computational studies, this can be done with an R markdown or a Jupyter notebook template. And we strongly recommend keeping all research plans and procedures in one comprehensive notebook. So let's take a look at that. So we have the procedure folder, and it is a code typed procedure. So code, code folder. RPR Spielman 2020 Python notebook is the reproduction study and its report in one notebook. This Jupyter notebook contains all of the narrative and the computational code for our study integrated into one single document. In addition, an advantage of using our template is that we'll seed the template with commonly used code to set up a computational environment and manage that computational environment, including documenting the requirements text file of all the packages contained in the research. Therefore, by using a notebook, we're making a clear link between the narrative of a study and the procedures used to conduct that study, starting with the computational environment. That also includes describing the data and data sources in your study. And so the analysis plan template also prompts users to specify the metadata for all the data sources to be downloaded, used, or created during the study. We have also templates for creating that metadata and importing them into the analysis plan document. Analysis planning includes researching or creating metadata for research data inputs. So we also, in the template repository, if we go back to the root of the repository and navigate into the data folder and to the metadata subfolder of that data, we have metadata templates which have already been filled out for this study uh, following the ISO standards for documenting spatial metadata. And these templates are easily included into the pre-analysis plan um, and make sure that your data is findable, interoperable, reusable, and accessible according to the FAIR standards. Once a plan is complete, you can render a PDF and save it to the docs folder. So let's navigate back up to the root and down to docs and report and Spielman report and record that one integrated document with all of the data, code, uh, and procedure information necessary to understand a uh, study in its entirety. The benefit of working with the Git repository is that each step of this research development is version tracked. And we can see that in the 97 commits of different versions of this study as it developed over time. For data science research, the next step is acquiring and creating data. We do this with the computational notebook, populating unmodified data in raw directory and downstream process data drives folders. So let's see, a computational notebook. So in a computational no notebook, we include code to acquire data directly from the census and save that into our raw folder. Uh, so under data, we have a raw folder where the unmod unmodified data should go, and we have public and private options. The public option okay, that is suitable for census data uh, contains data in its raw, unmodified form. If necessary for confidential data, you may save that into a private folder that is not version tracked or made public in any way. Once you reach the analysis stage of research, results are generated and displayed in the notebook. So if we scroll down far enough, we can find uh, some of our preliminary results in tabular form. And here's a, an attempt to reproduce identically a figure from the original Spielman et al. paper. The advantage of, of course, of using a computational notebook is that these figures are generated, generated dynamically with the original data. So there's no chance of trans transcription errors or other small mistakes in table or figure development, which are extremely common in the research that we've already viewed for our reproduction and replication studies. These results are also output in data in the repository under the data derived section, uh, uh, under the public section for our reproduction study results. Additionally, figures can be output from the Jupyter notebook into a results folder with figures, um, for example, a reproduction of figure one, 
from the original research effort. From here, the researcher only needs to continue populating the remainder of the story in terms of the discussion uh, and key conclusions and to generate another report uh, for the final results. Under docs uh, report, we can find our reproduction report PDF. In addition to rendering a PDF report, you can also render a LaTeX version of your report. And for those preparing to submit a manuscript for review, that LaTeX can be edited into the manuscript or the manuscript. And this is also another point at which you might want to register the report on OSF to make a permanent version of your research project at that point in time. Um, however, the life cycle of this open science research project is not complete here. If we go back to the root of our project, we can see that we've already created an OSF project, registered a reproduction report, and registered an analysis plan for pre-registration. So this analysis plan contains hypotheses and planned analytical approaches to solve additional questions that came up as a result of the reproduction attempt. And we are going to integrate that with pedagogy by assigning this replication attempt to students as a major project in an open source GI science course this fall. And as that work unfolds, and we'll keep propagating and updating this GitHub repository with additional report registrations, uh, preprints, and publications as the work progresses. And one of the main advantages, of course, of the open science approach that is that we could also get feedback from the public on this work and intermediate projects published. And at the end of the day, this particular research compendium is actually a fully computationally uh, reproducible uh, research compendium because we've done it with uh, Jupyter and Jupyter Notebooks and created a binder and binder container to um, execute all the code in the study. Hopefully this example study has given you some motivation to explore our XRR template. We also have a manual in, developing, uh, in development for using that template. Any questions that you have are extraordinarily valuable to us because we'd love to answer those questions in our manual. And finally, if you're interested in getting started with using the template, GitHub provides this nice bright green button called Use This Template. Hey, thanks for uh, listening along with that video. I imagine that it has raised some questions. Uh, and lucky enough, it also gave Qualtrics enough time to render the survey results. Uh, lucky enough, I seem to have just closed that. Uh, that well, well, Joey window. pulls that back up. <laughs> I will say, just to keep encouraging people to ask questions in the Q&A or in the chat, um, we've already been responding to some of those questions there. Um, and after we go through the survey results here in a second, we did obviously leave a bunch of time to take a look at the template and sort of interactively answer questions and discuss um, aspects of reproducibility broadly, but also specific to the template as well. So, you know, please keep writing questions in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, that's very helpful to us. Let's keep um, them in the Q&A. No, in the Q&A, that would be fine, yeah. Uh, and we'll respond to those there, and we'll probably bring some up to the stage as well for further discussion in a few minutes. But I'll hand it back to Joe to show our uh, quick survey results from the beginning of the session. None of those have propagated and can help us kind of orient some of this discussion that we're about to have in a moment. So, hand it to you, Joe. Sure. Screen two. Uh, great. Um, so they mostly track with what we expected, but there are some differences. And so just to help you interpret this graph that you see here, um, the blue bar means that that many that's the number of respondents that said that they were already using a particular practice. Um, the orange means that they were aware and interested, and the red is unaware or uninterested. And they're sorted from by frequency of the already using on the left. So that's great. A lot of us are already using open source software, probably our Python, I imagine, maybe QGIS uh, or Geoda or some of their related things. Uh, I'm really impressed with the awareness of metadata in this group. That sort of doesn't track 
with uh, responses from a general geography audience, but maybe it's a self-selecting audience here with spatial data science. Sharing data and sharing code are also very uh, prevalent. Open licenses, I'm impressed with how far across that is. Version control, I'm also pretty impressed. Maybe that's because of the growing popularity of platforms like GitHub, I imagine. Um, but then, so what we were talking about is that putting it on GitHub isn't quite enough. Like you also need a more permanent archive than GitHub provides. And GitHub does not automatically give you a DOI link that you can cite in your research paper. So for the folks that are in the middle here on digital archive with DOI, what we recommend is uh, registering for an OSF account or a Figshare account or something similar like that, because they easily integrate with GitHub. Um, you can connect your GitHub account to OSF, um, connect to OSF projects to a specific GitHub um, repository, um, and then OSF will make that permanent archived copy for you and give you a DOI. Um, actually doing reproduction or replication studies, uh, it's a topic for another day, but we really hope that we can start integrating this into undergraduate and graduate courses um, and training of young geographers. And I will say we've had some success on that front already. Um, some work that I've done in the graduate statistics class has turned into a series of reproduction studies that we just published along with sort of a initial version of this template in geographical analysis that should be coming out um, in the next few months. And there's a preprint for that available already that can be found through the all the HEX infrastructure that we shared, or HEXR infrastructure that we shared earlier. So yeah. as I mentioned, if you follow us, uh, you'll probably see some updates yeah. to this Spielman replication study uh, that my undergraduate students complete this fall. Uh, in terms of a reproducible computational environment, so that, that makes sense based on the way we see people publishing their papers. There just isn't enough attention paid to the system that you're doing your work on and tracking the versions of the software and the packages. And honestly, giving credit to the authors of the research packages that you're using in Python or in R. Um, they probably have published a paper somewhere out there with a, a citation that they would love to receive from you if you're using their code. Um, and so let's pay more conscious attention to this art because it won't take that much effort, but it will make things a lot uh, easier to reproduce and it will give a lot more credit to the researchers who are writing the code that we are using. Uh, in terms of a research compendium, this should be easy to start using if you're already a person who's doing metadata, sharing data, sharing code, and using version control, it just means keeping everything in the same place and consistent internal links, and ideally using a commonly accepted template uh, similar to the one that we just presented in the video. Yeah. Or maybe pushing forward all the way to like a Docker um, file where you can kind of pile everything together in one thing. Oh, that's not necessarily necessary. Right. Right. And then I would say the last one that Joe's going to move to next well, you can is pre-registration. Pre <laughs> and this also tracks with the larger survey of the geographic community that we've done, where the majority of people just weren't familiar with the practice of pre-registration. Um, and I kind of understand this to some degree because, you know, this is much more pro uh, common and really hypothesis-driven uh, fields such as like medicine or things like this where you're doing a clinical trial and you have uh, a lot of opportunity post data collection to sort of like tweak your hypotheses, tweak your groupings and things like this. Not that we don't have those opportunities in geography, but we often don't have that kind of more strictly confirmatory research approach to our research. So this is something that I'm not surprised isn't a common practice here, but is something that is useful, um, even in the sense of just sort of getting a stamp on the idea and your analysis plan early on. We often know projects will often take a long time to implement and execute and get published and things like that. So doing a pre-registration has this additional benefit of not only making sort of your um, your plan available, but sort of also making it known that you develop this plan at a specific point in time. So often when we're thinking about reproduction and replication, we run into these kind of incentive problems. Um, a lot of this stuff obviously takes a lot of time. The idea of the infrastructure that we're trying to build is to reduce that time. We're not saying it's the only way to do it. We're trying to give you some tools that make it easier to work with these things. But there's also an incentive on the other end in terms of like, you know, we really get rewarded in the community at the moment for peer reviewed publications of original research. So kind of fitting these practices into that reward system is obviously important and pre-registration might be one way to do that. 
in the long run, it becomes more widely accepted in our research communities. So it's also worth noting that in an educational or curricular context, uh, there's uh, evidence in the literature, it's mostly anecdotal, anecdotal from, from teachers' experiences uh, starting to introduce pre-registration of analysis plans into their methods courses. But uh, from other disciplines, they definitely perceive um, increased sense of agency and quality of research from students if an early phase of doing any kind of independent research project is actually to create uh, the analysis plan. And we do that with other students and with the professor. Yeah, and I will say one of the big pushes that we've been doing with this infrastructure as well is it's not just for research, we're really directly integrating into all of our teaching. And again, some of that is available on the websites we've shared. Um, but one of the key things that we find is that, you know, students can pick up coding to some degree, they can pick up different spatial analysis techniques, but the difficulty in kind of moving to that research level is the project design um, phase and sort of like having people develop a pre-analysis plan collectively in a class is one of the key um, one of the key elements that we've added to our teaching that has really made it easier for students to develop kind of these project soft skills around research design and linking the different parts of a project together uh, and really using a reproduction or replication as a way for them to deconstruct a project and then reconstruct it potentially with slight variations or iterations or robustness checks or things like that. So they learn the techniques, but they also learn these soft skills, these research design skills at the same time. And kind of having them build that pre-analysis plan is the key activity for doing that. Um, moving towards uh, some of these questions here, that's the response from the surveys, but we got a number of good questions, both the chat and the Q&A. I think one to start with that we often get when we present these materials was pointed out by uh, Bing Zhu from Texas A&M University. And they asked the question about, um, are we gonna continually dynamically updating these templates? And how are we anticipating dealing with um, privacy concerns and private data? So we've got comment responses to those questions in the um, comment stream for the questions, but I think it's worth talking about them here briefly as well. Um, I'll say to the one about whether we're gonna to continue to dynamically update the templates, Yes, for sure. Um, these are all version tracked and being built as we sort of encounter them. And they're informed by the reproductions and replications and the original research we're doing with these templates. Um, if you look at some of our older uh, reproduction attempts, you'll see they're built with earlier versions of the templates. And we're trying to make them, again, not uh, too prescriptive for using one software, one package, but really building this backbone for integrating all these practices together. Um, and certainly that's changing in, in time as the software change, as these practices change, um, as things move forward. I will say additionally to that, another key thing is uh, we need more grist for the mill in a way. We need more uh, projects, more different types of projects, right? A lot of the work we've been doing has sort of been statistical, uh, spatial statistical, because that's my end of the word in GIS, that's both of our ends of the discipline. Um, but there are many different forms of spatial analysis research, spatial data science research that we just haven't touched on yet, that I'm sure will stress this infrastructure in different ways. So the more we have collaborators that want to work with us um, to bring these things into their classrooms, bring these things into their research, that is good for us because it gives us those stress tests so that we can, one, advance the infrastructure, but more importantly, hopefully, help our collaborators advance the science in the areas of research by making their work more reproducible and answering questions in a way that can be built upon in the future. So I think that's a key uh, aspect of definitely, it's not just about making these things better, it's about um, answering questions in these areas with these tools. So yeah. if you want to add to that, Joe? Uh, not too much other than I'm starting to be more mindful about releasing numbered versions on <laughs> GitHub and referring to those with the template headings so that we can keep track of which version of a template some particular study is using. Um, and also that uh, at the iGUIDE Symposium coming up this fall, we'll be presenting our work on this in comparison to what other disciplines have been doing. And we've been finding um, several things about the pre-analysis registration and research compendium design from other disciplines that are inadequate or unsuitable for geographers. And so it's important for us to start working on this and kind of come together as a community to 
to design one that works for a variety of geographic studies. Um, and uh, by no means are we locked into the version that we've re uh, released to you just now. We want feedback and we want to make it widely applicable. Yeah, and this actually touches on some comments that Yano and Mike Gould have made in the, in the chat string as well about the idea of you know, how strict should we be with these different um, prescriptions here about reproducibility? Do we need a full computational reproduction? Uh, Yano makes the point of we should expect similar results across platforms, right? And I think we agree with that, right? I think we're building the infrastructure not because we want to be super prescriptive about using one platform or one type of approach. I think the key thing that we're interested in, probably most of us as scientists or data scientists or geographers, how we want to label ourselves, is really the inferences we make from our work and what they say about the world, right? So I think if we kind of keep that idea in mind, and again, that's why in the definitions at the beginning, we wanted to highlight those purposes rather than just making the data or just making the results available. It's about the conclusions and the validation or the checking of the prior claims. So we are trying to make an infrastructure where we're trying to encourage people to do reprojections and replications to do that checking function, not so much to just you know, use one type of approach or one type of pathway. Of course, that's gonna change in the future. Uh, we expect it to, we expect science to advance and come up with better ways to do things. The question is sort of like uh, building up our knowledge base as quickly as possible. And we're trying to just facilitate that in these different ways that we've talked about here. Add to that, Joe? Uh, not to that comment so much sure. as, well, there's simply the problem of like, how different is, uh, how much of a difference matters, yeah, right? Uh, because we definitely see differences uh, across versions of our Python or their packages uh, or between our Python or other software uh, when implementing the same methodology. Um, so there are variations there. A little bit of variation maybe doesn't matter for its implications for the claims that the research is making. Um, but there just isn't, we don't have that much experience yet doing this in geography to sort of delineate what those thresholds of difference are and how much they matter, right? Yeah, and in an interesting way, like this is how these questions really track back to some of the core debates in our discipline. Uh, Joe and I have written a couple of papers about sort of thinking about the um, conversation about laws and geography as a sort of a form of discussion about replication, right? It's really about what we expect to see things uh, in different places, right? What we expect to get the same results in different places. This is basically a question of will study results replicate across locations, across contexts. And we know places are different. We know contexts are different. So what's the relevant amount of variation that we would expect to see in results to say there's a similar process here or the process is different enough that we wouldn't expect to see things um, hold across many locations. And this, of course, has super important implications, not only for how we do our work, but for what we do in the world based on our work. When we want to intervene to change systems, to improve the real world, right? These are important fundamental questions from the discipline of geography, spatial data science that we haven't resolved and really are open for continued debates and continued advancement through doing this kind of work and other kinds of work as well. Should we tackle Bing's as question about sure. privacy and yeah. ethics? Um, so that question was, I think r, &R requires a lot of transparency of the work and data sharing. How do you balance r, &R with the growing concern of the privacy issue? Thank you. And so I think two approaches to that. Um, one is the template is set up so that there is space inside the template to save that private data or that confidential data or proprietary data. Uh, without it being version tracked and shared to GitHub or archived anywhere. Uh, so the infrastructure is set up to accommodate that type of information. And then what you want to do is process that information just enough to meet uh, the threshold or requirement that it needs to meet in order to be shared. So whether it's aggregation, de-identification, randomization, or whatever kind of process you need to apply to it um, to manipulate it into a form that can be shared, you provide the code for that process and then you move that data from the private domain to the derived public domain as soon as it's feasible to do so. The second option is that we need to do more work on infrastructure for some kind of, uh, some kind of archive with credentialing for other researchers to be able to get access to the confidential data that you have used in your research. And that would mean some kind of process like uh, following an IRB or Institutional Review Board Ethics Review for a protocol and credentialing to access that data. 
And if you do that, then what is possible is to provide the code for downloading that data, um, given a, uh, credentials to access it on some kind of server, and then proceed with the research from there. Another possible option, and this is sort of analogous to the way that we deal with microdata in the census, um, there you sort of bring your research question to the census, go into the census data center, conduct your analysis, and leave. There could potentially be a possibility for infrastructure where you design the GitHub repository. You pass that GitHub repository to the confidential data center. They execute the code that you've given them in that GitHub repository, and they give it back with the results, but none of the confidential data um, underlying those. Yeah, and I will say there's been some efforts in our discipline to build in that direction. I know Doug Richardson and Maple Pond were pushing in that direction, working with the University of Michigan, and that project is ongoing, building those kind of passport infrastructures. Um, we're running out of time here at the moment, so I think uh, with those sentiments, we'll kind of wrap up. Uh, I will thank everyone for joining us. I will say, you know, we did a lot in a little bit of time, and I know the template that we presented um, has a lot of information in it, so please reach out to us. We're very happy to go through those things again with you. We're very happy to work with anyone to try to integrate this into their research or their courses. So please reach out. We can be contacted through the uh, HEGSRR GitHub IO website. Um, Kitty asked me as we were closing here to remind everyone that we have a one hour break coming up in the sessions for kind of a lunch or dinner break, depending on where you are in the world, maybe breakfast. Um, but we'll be returning in about one hour uh, to resume the session series. And uh, Kitty, if you want to add anything to that, I will let you do so. If not, I think we will move to take a break and see everyone in about one hour. Thanks so much for your attention and thanks again. Yeah, thank you.